Good morning, guys. Spiritual Whistleblower here. I got to promote, promote, promote because less than a week away, I will be in Toronto, Canada for the very first time. I will be at Dufferin Grove. There's a comedy theater there. So all my Canadians, you always wanted to meet me. I've coached many of y'all. I have a lot of Canadian clients. So this is your chance to come through and meet me in person and I'll get all your questions answered, all relationship advice, whatever you're going through. I'll be doing a book signing. There's food. Toronto, let's, let's turn up. Y'all have been buying tickets, but I'm going to keep promoting and pushing this until the day of. I'll be there next Saturday. Sorry about that. My, my window's open and you know New York City is so loud. But I will be in Toronto, Canada next Saturday, September 24th. Then the following week, I will be in Houston, Texas to kick off Domestic Violence Awareness Month, which is October. October 1st, I will be in Houston, Texas. So uh, my people in Houston, my people in Texas, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, y'all can drive, y'all can fly in. People, if you live out of state and want to fly into Texas, this will be the last um, city I do for my tour. So, you know, Houston, Texas, uh, hit me up. I will pin my email down below for tickets, chanelljasmine at gmail.com. Again, um, I'm going to continue this series that I've been doing on narcissistic friends. You guys really seem to enjoy it. I'm reading the comments and I'm getting great feedback. And um, I hope it's helping y'all. And please continue to to give some feedback if you've gone through something like this type it in the comments because you don't know how much you're helping people there's people reading your comments and they're getting they're receiving healing and validation um knowing that they're not alone all right so this video pay attention i'm about to drop some free game i'm always dropping game i try to you know talk about things and approach things differently than all the other life coaches and people talking about this. I look at things through a spiritual lens and um, I try to catch the little stuff and, and talk about it, the really niche stuff that gets overlooked about narc abuse. So in this video, I wanna talk about perception management in a narcissistic friendship and how they will play their friends against each other to maintain this image, this goody two shoes image that they want everyone to, to uh, you know, every they want everyone to think they're such a good person. But they're going to absolutely, if there's a group of friends, they're absolutely going to have it out for one person in the group that you're going to be the scapegoat. If they don't like you, you will become their scapegoat. And when I say scapegoat, you know the scapegoat is the person, you know, could be in the family. If your mother and father and uh, you had siblings, your parents turned you into the scapegoat and they might have spoiled your brother and sister and let them get away with everything and coddle your brother and everything, you know, they bullied you. And, and, you know, especially my ladies, if you have a narcissistic mother like I did and you have a brother, your mother's going to coddle your brother and spoil him. And then she's going to punish you and make you do all the chores and make you pay for everything. And she's going to punish you and treat him special. So, you know, that's because mom has made you the scapegoat of the family out of her children. The scapegoat takes on all of the abuse of the family setting. So that same thing applies when it comes to a narcissistic friendship. When there's a narcissist amongst a group of friends, he's going to select, he or she is going to select one individual out of that group of friends to become the scapegoat. Follow me now, okay? I'm gonna break this down so y'all get this. And I'm breaking out the whiteboard today. I haven't used my whiteboard in a long time. It helps me, you know, it brings out the point really strongly when I demonstrate it on the whiteboard. So I'm gonna get into the whiteboard to, to, to make this shit pop so y'all can really catch it. Uh, in a narcissistic friendship, you will become the scapegoat because the, the, the narcissist cannot be consistent with this goody two-shoe behavior. It's not who he is, that's not his character. So the real him is an empty vessel. He's cruel, he's mean, he has no empathy, but he can't let the rest of the group of friends know that. So he has to vent some sort of way. He's going to choose one person out the group to take his frustrations out on and to mistreat. 
but he's going to do it in a very sneaky, covert way where the rest of the group of the friends cannot see it. So I want to talk about perception management and how they will use you as the scapegoat in the group of friends to maintain their perfect goody two-shoe. They're such a goody two-shoes, aren't they? When they get in front of everybody, oh, they're charming, they're charismatic and bubbly and hi and ah, uh, hi, oh, you look so nice and da da, -da. They're, they, they're pumping your friends with compliments. They're blowing smoke up everybody's asses. Oh, they're just the life of the party. But that's not who they really are. That is the perception they want people to think of them. So, you know, that's why they can't, they, they, they need to go somewhere alone so that they can, you know, calm down and they, they might have to drink and smoke to, to you know, to tame that, that inner demon because that inner demon wants to pop out, but it can't. The narc has to keep the inner demons tamed while he's in, in around the group of friends because he's got to be this perfect image and not the demon. He can't let the group of friends see him for who he really is. And that's stressful than a motherfucker to a narcissist. So he will always select one, possibly two, possibly, but he, he's going to have it out for one particular friend in that group. And he will scapegoat you the same way that your mother scapegoat you uh, against your siblings. She, she glorified your sibling and spoiled your sibling, but she would mistreat you. So perception management is basically the narcissist's way of controlling the whole narrative of the friendship. He's got to look like a saint to the entire group. That's why, you know, as a group, when y'all are out having fun, y'all might be at a party, a club scene, y'all might be vacationing. When he's around that group, he's a perfect gentleman. He's he's bubbly. He's the life of the group of the party. He's, you know, entertaining. He's cracking jokes so that everybody as a group can perceive him to be this wonderful person, you know, so, so lovely and charismatic. But the narcissistic friend will also spend time individually getting to know each friend one-on-one -on -one away from the group. He's got to study every personality amongst the group of friends to see what he can do and use and benefit, excuse me, benefit. So each friend, he's got to see, well, this friend over here, um, they've got a big old house down south. And this friend over here is very popular on social media. And this friend over here, um, they make they make six figures. Like they're they're seeing what benefits and perks they can can get out of each friend. And if a friend can't provide them with resources and, and they're of no use, then he's gonna be like, oh, I can't do nothing with with that friend. But as a group, he's going to make sure he's on his best behavior so that collectively you all can think, wow, he's such a nice person. Wow, she's such a lovely friend. She's so bubbly. She's full of jokes. I didn't know she was that funny. Ha ha he he. Perception. They've got to keep their image intact in front of the group of friends. So what your mom and dad did is a similar thing. In your childhood, there's a word, and I, I've talked about this in my past videos, the word is called pseudo pseudo mutuality. Let me see if you spelled that wrong. Pseudo, I think I spelled mutuality wrong. I don't know. Y'all correct me. Pseudo mutuality. What is pseudo mutuality? Well, in your childhood, think back. Think to think back to all the abusive tactics your mother kept targeting you and bullying you and mistreating you and downplaying your success and invalidating you while she praised your siblings. Nobody knows that your mother is abusing you because she's doing it in such a covert manner. And she's telling the rest of the family, there's something wrong with my child. My child is mentally ill. Something's wrong. Nothing's wrong with you, but your mother is painting the narrative so that the rest of the family can turn against you. And she can tell her friends and her peers at church, 
my child, I don't know what's wrong with my child. You know, she doesn't listen. She doesn't do what she's, she's told at home. And she's, she's, she, your mother's gossiping. And ladies, if you have a narc mother like I, like I do, then she's jealous of her own daughter. So your mama will get out here and talk a lot of shit about her own daughter. And it's really hurtful. Then did you notice that the moment you go to church with your mama, how all of a sudden her personality will switch. And now she becomes this loving mother. Oh, I'm here in church with my children. She wants people to perceive that she's this wonderful, loving kitchen mother, this lovely housewife who, who loves her children. And she's going to have this, this whole fake facade going on when she's out in the streets and when she's in church. That is pseudo mutuality. And she's going to teach you, you're the scapegoat. Don't you say nothing. What goes on in, in this house stays in this house. Don't you get out here and embarrass me. So you're being trained to tolerate and accept the abuse and sweep it underneath the rug to protect your mama's image. Then when y'all go, when, when y'all go to church and y'all are out at functions and you're sitting there like, mom doesn't act like this at home. She's such a bitch when we're at home. That is perception management. Your mom wants everyone to think she's this wonderful mother, this wonderful housewife, but she's really a bully and a bitch when she's at home. So that behavior, this is, I want y'all to really look this up and Google the term pseudo mutuality. That's when a family, a toxic family, uh, cohesively works together to keep a, per, a certain perception, a goody two shoe type of perception. They want to maintain this fake persona in the streets, but when, when they get home behind closed doors, every type of thing is going down. Domestic violence, cheating, sexual molestation, abuse, and they hide it from everybody. And they train their kids, I'll beat you, I'll punish you. Don't you open your mouth. Don't you tell nobody what's going on. What stays, what goes on in this house stays in the house. But then when y'all out in the streets, your parents switch up that behavior and they become the wonderful, perfect mom and dad. And they, they don't give a fuck about their kids. They just care about their image. Perception management, pseudo mutuality. So let's get into how this behavior is used in, in, in a friendship setting where there's a fake friend who's a narcissist pretending to be a really good person. So I've drawn, this is the fake friend, this is the narcissist here. Look at his face, I made sure I drew an evil face. Here's you, empath, friend number one. And here's another friend, empath number two. I'll use it. This is me. Let's just pretend this is spiritual whistleblower right here. I'll use myself as an example. A uh, spiritual whistleblower is a no nonsense individual. I have built my platform over the years um, very passionately about things that are near and dear to my heart domestic violence, black femicide, spiritual warfare. And I've spent lots of time coaching and helping people escape abusive relationships of all sorts. People are constantly saying, thank you. How can I repay you? When you come to my city, let me take you to dinner. Take this, I say, I tell people all the time, don't bring me no gifts. They bring me flowers. They bring me gifts. I've gotten jewelry, I've gotten clothes, I've gotten perfume. Uh, one, one of my friends uh, in Detroit, Charletta, God bless her, beautiful person. I, I, you know, I tell people don't do it. They do it anyway. I get to Detroit. She gave, she went to the Chanel store and brought me a beautiful gift, a whole gift set from Chanel, perfume samples from Chanel, all type luxury. This is straight luxury. I said, sis, drop some money on this. And I, I, you know, I'm, I've never been used to, you know, used to, you know, I, my, my, my mother trained me not to um, be deserving of gifts. And I have this thing with me. I don't feel right accepting gifts. And I'm trying to change that. People want to show gratitude all the time when I travel city to city. I'm really working on trying to, you know, change that. Because every time, you know, I've had it where people have thrown things in my face after they've done and offered and, you know, and that's not cool. So I have this habit of turning people down and pushing people away. But there's, there's genuine people out here that really do give from the heart and do from the heart. And I'm trying to change, you know, that behavior 
because that stems from my childhood of my mother teaching me that I'm not deserving of receiving anything. So um, here's me and here's friend number two, two empaths. This third friend is the narcissist, the fake friend. Now I'm gonna tell you, this fake friend is gonna come into this group of friends and what he has to do, he's got to choose a scapegoat amongst the group of friends. He's going to target one specific friend and that one specific, that one specific friend normally has the most money, the most leverage and the most power over the narcissist. And like I said, narcissists are envious of people that are doing better than them. So if he targets this individual, he wants the same level of success and he, he, he understands that in order to get close to this person, he has to uh, be on his best behavior to study. I, this happens to me all the time. People, people pretend to be one thing just to get close to me just and they're studying me so that they can destroy me. They're on their best behavior in the beginning, but they're doing that to get close to me to study, wow, how does she do what she do? I gotta get closer. How does she wear her hair? How does she dress? What does she eat? They're studying everything about you. Then they're gonna use it against you, throw it in your face and try to destroy you at some point. So narcissists are obsessed with people that are successful and famous and have a lot of money. And if there's someone particularly in the group of friends that is that has more money, more leverage, the narcissist is gonna to wanna to get close to that friend real fast. But in the process of love bombing this friend, he has to devalue the other friends and he doesn't know how to control that behavior. That's where the inconsistency comes at, comes from. If he was truly an empath, he would be able to stay consistent with, with, with praising one friend and praising the others. He doesn't know how to do that. If he's praising one friend, I can guarantee you he's devaluing and degrading another friend. That's how they are. When you're in a relationship with a narcissist and he's degrading you and mistreating you, he's love bombing his side chick. Y'all know how this, this behavior goes. They cannot stay consistent for shit. If they're kicking down one person, they're praising another. So while you're being cheated on, disrespected at home, he's whining and dining his side chick and treating her special. Same thing with narcissistic friendships. You can best believe this toxic friend is praising and love bombing the fuck out of the friend who he really wants to get close with while he's shitting on another friend very privately where the rest of the group can't see it. He has to mirror you. If he sees that you're already friends, y'all, you and you and this other friend have a tight bond and he's coming in the group of friends like, I want to get close to that second friend. That second friend has a lot of money and a lot of shit that I want. I want to be on that level. I'm envious. But I see that this, this friend that has the money is really fond of spiritual whistleblowers. She loves the fuck out of spiritual whistleblower. They got a close thing going on. They're friends. They're cool. I got to figure out how I'm going to get close to this friend who has a lot of money. So what he does he gets close to spiritual whistleblower and he builds a rapport, a good rapport. He mirrors because narcissists don't have an identity. He's going to mirror spiritual whistleblower's personality. He's going to pretend to uh, like all the things that spiritual whistleblower likes. He's going to pretend to be a domestic violence advocate. He's going to pretend that he cares about black women causes. And he's going to, care, he's going to pretend that he's into narcissistic abuse recovery and awareness. He's got to put on a front to impress spiritual whistleblower in order to look like a good person to the very to the friend that spiritual whistleblower is already close with. And what, what's going to happen at some point, he's going to be nice to spiritual whistleblower. He's going to do things like invite her out. She might, she might hang with this person, go to his home, go out for drinks, but he's doing all this. Spiritual whistleblower thinks he's being a genuine friend when in all actuality, the only reason he's being nice to spiritual whistleblower is because he wants to impress spiritual whistleblower's friend. So if he's doing all these nice things for spiritual whistleblower, he knows that her friend that she's close with 
is going to assume, wow, that he's a really nice guy. Look how good he's treating spiritual whistleblower. He knows I love spiritual whistleblower, so he, he's, he's all right with me. I'm, I'm, I like that. So she's going to begin to let her guard down with this fake friend based on the fact that he's treating spiritual whistleblower so well. But nobody knows that this is all an act and that he's actually mirroring spiritual whistleblower, mirroring her personality, pretending to, to like her. He doesn't like, he can't stand spiritual whistleblower. All that's going to come out at the end because he's going to start mistreating spiritual whistleblower when he feels that he's comfortable and he's gotten close to this friend who has the money. He doesn't need spiritual whistleblower no more because he's gotten in. He's invited. He's gotten close to this friend. He's invited her to come over his house. And now he's building a really close rapport with the friend who has money. So he no longer needs spiritual whistleblower as a scapegoat. Or I, not a scapegoat. I would say a tool to get close to. This is his intended target. He has an intended target. He wants to get close to the friend that's wealthy and has a lot of money. So he has to pretend like he likes spiritual whistleblower so she can perceive that he's a good person and he, he likes domestic, he's, he's all about domestic violence. Everything that spiritual whistleblower advocates and fights for, he has become, he's mimicking spiritual whistleblower and pretending to be the same. Just to impress the friend that has the money and he wants to get close to her now. So she's going to naturally let her guard down because in the group setting, she's like, wow, we get along so great as friends. This is awesome. I, I, you know, it's an act. She doesn't realize he's performing. But spiritual whistleblower starts to detect something ain't right with him. There's red flags all over the place. And spiritual whistleblower knows something is off. The friend doesn't know it yet because that fake friend is a covert narcissist and he's done a great job of grooming everybody. So if spiritual whistleblower talks shit and exposes him, nobody's going to believe spiritual whistleblower. So he, that perception management, they thrive off of it. They, they thrive off of you looking at them. They want everyone to believe that they're a good person, but they have an agenda to be destructive, divisive, messy. They will step on you to get to their intended target. If there is one specific friend that they feel that they can leech off of, latch onto, use, uh, um, this, this friend has tons of resources and money and stuff, Oh, honey, they got to figure out how to get close to this friend. And if they got to use you to step on you, pretend to like you and be your friend just to get close to this friend, that's what they're going to do. But where they fuck up, they're going to slip because they cannot be consistent with treating everybody equally. They're going to end up treating this one friend, love bombing and ass kissing and brown nosing this friend and they're going to be shitting on you behind closed doors. And they do it in such a way that if you complain about it, the rest of the friends are not going to believe you because he's such a nice person. Oh my God, no, no way, that can't be. So like I taught y'all yesterday, you stay silent. You cut and block this toxic fake friend off. And eventually his behavior, he will slip up. And the rest of the group especially your friend, your close friend, they'll start to see it for themselves. Be careful of perception management. Stop judging people off of presentation, monitor their behavior and how they treat others when nobody's looking. Narcissists, especially when they're coverts, they cannot be consistent in a group setting. They can get everybody together and entertain everybody but individually, they can't stay consistent. While they're love bombing one friend, trust and believe they're shitting on another and they're doing it in a very breadcrumbing, discreet, covert, nasty type of way. And they do it in a way that if you complain to the rest of the group, nobody's gonna believe you. 
I pray the blood of Jesus over all of y'all. Nobody, nobody should be subjected to this type of abuse. It's really sick and demonic. The limps, the limp, the limp that they will go through to use and abuse, break up people's friendships, break up, uh, um, um, it's just sickening and it's demonic. The mind games, the triangulation, and the greed, it's straight up greed. But see, God sees everything. God's not going to let you carry on with this fake friend. God is going to say enough is enough. I'm about to, I'm about to shine a light and I'm going to show you who this motherfucker really is and give it some time. The rest of your friends will see it too. Let time do its job. And on that note, guys, Toronto and Houston, I'll see you guys Toronto next week, Houston, October 1st, Spiritual Whistleblower. God bless y'all. Have a great day.